We have all had fathers. We've all had different fathers. Some provided for us. Some didn't care for us at all. Some of them loved us and shared with something they loved with us, a hobby, something close and dear to them. Maybe they loved their, their, they loved their family dearly and they would die for them. Some fathers even abuse their children. So we all have different experiences when it comes to our fathers. How do you picture God? Do you see him as a father or a grandfather figure? There's a reason that the family structure is used to show the relationships in Christianity and in the church. For it shows the love of God for his people as a father loves his earthly family. Let's see how Jesus describes his father in Luke 15. Let's pray. Most gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray for this time. I pray that your spirit, the power of your spirit would go before us at the reading, teaching, preaching of your word. I pray that you would bless this time, especially for your glory, that we might see the richness of your love for us and the depth that you go to find what is lost. Lord Jesus, thank you. I praise you and I thank you this, for this moment, for these next few moments. I pray that your word would richly bless each one of our lives. I pray that our hearts would be open, our ears would hear and eyes would see what you would have us to see. Lord Jesus, thank you for giving us your word. For it's in your name, for your glory, by the power of your spirit, we pray. Amen. Open your Bibles to Luke 15. Chris, sounds like there's some echoing going on. Is that just me and my hearing aids? It's good? Okay. Luke 15, and follow me along as I read the entire chapter. <clears throat> now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to hear him, and the Pharisees and the, the scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable, What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it. And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so I tell you, oh, just so I tell you that there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than the 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. Or what woman, having 10 silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and seek diligently until she finds it? And when she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. Just so I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. And he said, There was a man who had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. 
So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate. And no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread? But I perish here with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against you. I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet, and bring the fattened calf and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his older son was in the field. And as he came and drew near the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused, and refused to go in. His father came out and treated him. But he answered his father, Look, see, many years I have served you, and I have never disobeyed your command. Yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad, for this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of our God will stand forever. All right. Notice, there are two types of people here. Both are listening to Jesus, one with anticipation and one with discontentment at what they're seeing. The tax collectors and sinners are drawing near to hear Jesus. Yet the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled. This word grumbled is very similar to the word used to describe the Israelites in the wilderness when they were upset over the manna. A strong undercurrent of discontentment or murmuring. Does murmuring ring true in your life? I know in mine, I, I see my children and if I ask them to do something, I get an eye roll or a murmur or something. Sometimes they, they're first-time obedience, and it's awesome. Now they're getting older, and they're adults, and they're doing their thing, and I, you know, I just pray that I have raised them well. But I know that in spite of me, God's grace is sufficient in their lives. As adults, do you murmur? I know I do. I've seen it. I don't want to get into the examples, but privately I'll be happy to, if you really want to know. You know, I'm kind of like Jonah. I get this calling, whatever it may be, not an audio <laughs> voice of God, but a, 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 a spirit a spirit being pricked that I should do X, should do Y, and I don't. I run the other direction. 
I don't do what I should do. Life's hard, and there's hard consequences and hard decisions to make. And sometimes it ain't fair. But I pray that we would be like Habakkuk, that we would rejoice in the God of our salvation, even when the cupboards are bare, when the bank accounts are bare, when we lose everything we have. I pray that that's what we'd be. But yet, we murmur. We murmur. And it's interesting that the Pharisees and scribes are murmuring. The religious elites. Pay attention to that throughout these three parables. Eating together was very important in Judaism and their culture. And the Jewish Authorities, the, the religious authorities, were shocked that Jesus would eat with unclean people. Because if you were eating with unclean people, you became unclean. He was sitting there, eating, fellowshipping with tax collectors and sinners. Praise God that the Lord eats and fellowships with sinners. Because he eats and fellowships with sinners, he can save sinners. But that also includes the Pharisees. If he was weak enough that he could not save the sinners, he could not save the Pharisees. Praise God that he can save both of them. There was a crisis in the early church in the first century. You know, Judaism was the prevailing religion of the Jews. It was, it was what they grew up on. Jesus comes in and he, he, he shocks the world because he says, you are saved by grace alone. And yet the Jewish Christians, some were telling their Gentile Christians that they had to believe and be baptized, grace plus works. And so you see in Acts 15, where the, Jer the, the Jerusalem Council met together to, to, to resolve this issue, is circumcision required? And the elders that gathered, the apostles that gathered, said no. But yet the church still struggled. If you look at Paul's letters, he's addressing this again and again because people, false teachers are saying, you need to be circumcised. Grace plus works. It is not about works, folks. It is not about works. And so this crisis of the early church was going on throughout the New Testament. This crisis still exists today. It still exists today. And I want to leave you with a question that I'm not going to answer, but we can talk about it later. How does it exist today? How do we see this crisis of inclusion or not inclusion? Is it healthy? Is it right? Or is it wrong? How do we see it in the church today? Again, praise the Lord that Jesus fellowships with sinners. So in Jesus' fashion, he proceeds to tell three parables to all who are listening, but is specifically directed to other Pharisees and scribes, because they were the ones that were grumbling. The first parable is about a lost sheep, one out of a hundred. You know, not, not, not bad ratio. You know, you lose one, you got 99, still works. You can have more children, I mean, more <laughs> children, more sheep. <laughs> um, but it tells of a shepherd searching and finding the lost sheep but then rejoices over the found sheep. Notice the shepherd. Pay attention to the shepherd. What does he do? 
He puts the sheep on his back, over his shoulders. What do you think he's experiencing besides the rejoicing of the found sheep? He smells that sheep, real intimate, because it's right there around his shoulders. So he smells it. He feels the sheep breathing. He knows that sheep. He feels the lifeblood pumping through its heart every time that heart beats. He feels it. It's right across his shoulders. That's our shepherd. That's Jesus. He doesn't just rescue us. He knows us intimately. He knows the struggles. He knows the hardships. He knows your very heartbeat. Once he returns, he tells his friends that he has found his sheep and to rejoice with him. And Jesus concludes the parable, there will be more joy in heaven over a sinner that repents. The second parable is very similar to the first. It's about a woman seeking her lost coin. Typically, women are not used in Jewish stories, in the culture, in the Jewish culture. You know, they're a step below the male religious elites, the male figure. Jesus uses the woman showing how he loves all. He loves the shepherd. Shepherd is one of the lowest professions you can be. Usually they're thieves. They're questionable people, but he uses the shepherd. Here he's using the woman because it's important to him, all people. You know, this woman was kind of relatively well off. She had a house. Whether she was renting or buying, I don't know, but she had a house. And back in that day, if someone owned animals... You know, out during the day, they would be out, the animals. But at night, for security, for warmth, for whatever, they would be brought inside. So there's animal bedding. There's animal manure. There's all the stuff that goes with animals inside the house. Well, lo and behold, she loses a coin. Did she just drop it and look down? Oh, there it is. No, it wasn't that. She lost it the previous day. Or some time period had passed from the time she had lost it to the time she just found it. But her seeking it was an intentional effort that took great energy searching for this coin. Because of the the very environment she was in. She probably didn't live in the houses we live in. No, probably about it, she didn't. This coin represented a day's wage back then. And no matter where it was or what it was in, she found it and she did what she had to do. What, what does she do when she finds the coin? She rejoices and tells her friends, I found this coin. And again, Jesus uses this parable and tells that the joy of heaven over a sinner who repents. There will be this joy, this great joy over this lost sinner. Both parables tell something that was lost and great efforts going into finding what was lost. Once found, rejoicing happens. See how the shepherd and the woman seek and find that was lost. They do not seek without finding such a great picture of our triune God. What he has foreordained to happen, happens. That includes your Salvation. The third parable, the longest, 
commonly known in all our translations, the prodigal son. You know, it's just not about, it's, yeah, prodigal son is a character, but it is about a gracious father because that's what that parable is about. It's the longest parable. It starts with a man, ends with the father. It's about a son who requests that his father split up his estate and give him his portion. This was something that was typically not done in the Jewish culture because it went against the Hebrew scriptures in Deuteronomy and Numbers. The father has to live and take care of the family on the proceeds, so it was not done. But the father does it anyway. By receiving his inheritance, the younger son is forsaking his father and his brother, his family. And listen carefully. Very similar to Adam and Eve sinning against the father. For the relationship that God had created initially, sin broke it. Sin changed the relationship. Just like the younger son asking for the inheritance changed the relationship. He was going to go off and do his own thing. Sin entered in. And you see that in the prodigal son. The son goes on a journey into a foreign land and blows his inheritance in reckless living with his newfound friends. He eventually runs out of money, being a fool with it, and all his friends leave him. You know, when the drinks quit being poured, the friends go away. When money runs out, the friends you thought you had usually go away. The friends that stick by you, you know, they're a good friend. There came a famine in the country, which caused him to be in need and very hungry. So he hired himself out to a man who sent him out to feed the pigs, longing or longed, and he, and he longed to be fed with the pigs out of the pods that the pigs ate out of. You know, this was probably one of the last jobs a Jew would accept, for it is unclean to be with these pigs where they lived, the good and bad. Kind of like an ultimate uncleanness in Judaism. No one gave him anything. No one cared. You know, I've been hungry before, but I've never been that hungry to eat livestock food. And I don't think none of us have. That's pretty bad off. And then the turn of events that happened in this parable. He came to his senses. Have you ever struggled with something and you had that aha moment? Something similar, but I think much more. As in the Christian's life, God's Spirit comes into your life and exposes your sin and your need for a Savior, and you repent and turn to Him. I think it's kind of a, 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 an, a, an, a, an illusion of that. Remembering his father's servants and how they were fed, he decides to go home and beg for forgiveness. When he arrives, his father sees him and runs to him. The father saw his son watching from afar, saw him a long way off. And recognizing him, what does he do? Does he wait? Does he walk out to the porch? No, he runs to him. He runs to the father, runs to the son. In the Jewish culture, fathers didn't run. People ran to the father. People ran to the patriarch. Because that's where their blessing was. That's, that's where the money came from. And here the son saw his father. 
the one he had forsaken. Run for him. Run to him, not from him. But run for him. The father was full of excitement over his lost son and threw a party to rejoice over his son returning safe and sound. Can't you just see the father running to the son? The excitement on his face. How would you feel to lose a child and then find him? You'd be heartbroken. But then out of the gracious works of God Almighty, he restores that relationship. And there's this excitement in your, your countenance, everything about you, and you run to your son. What re relief and excitement you would have, I bet you'd throw a party and tell others. I bet you would rejoice. Or would you in shame be grumbling and Bitterness, no. You'd re you would rejoice over what was lost is now found. When the son was giving his confession and going to ask for his job, it's almost like the father interrupts him. And what does he do? What does the father do? He brings the best robe, a ring and shoes for the son. He restores him to himself. Remember, at the beginning of the parable, he forsook the family. And here the father is restoring him to his sonship, to his family. Again, a wonderful, powerful picture of our triune God at work. But he doesn't stop there. He holds a party. He rejoices. He throws a feast celebrating. Kill the fattened calf. For he was dead and now alive. He was lost and now found. He was celebrating the return of his son. You know, the parable could have ended there. But then it goes on to talk about the elder son, the older son. What a, what a change that we see. You know, the elder son was working in the field like a slave, like a servant. Kind of what the younger son wanted to do now. And as he's coming out of the field, he sees this commotion. He hears the dancing and the feasting and the celebrating. And he asks a servant, what's happening? And the servant tells his brother that his brother has come home. The servant tells him that his brother has come home. And the father has killed the fattened calf to celebrate. Notice the, what happens. The elder son was angry and refused to go to the party. Again, my mind going right back to Jonah. God saved Nineveh because of Jonah preaching the word, and yet Jonah went up under this plant that God provided, waiting for the destruction of Nineveh. He was bitter. He was angry. He didn't want to have anything to do with Ninevites. And then what do we see happen? The father goes to his elder son. The elder son doesn't come to the father. The father hears and he goes to him. And when he goes to him, again, the father chasing both of them. Very similar as God, through the power of his spirit, comes to us to draw us to his house into his family. But what did the elder son do? Elder brother. He complained to his father in his self-righteousness. You could almost see him pointing his finger at his dad. 
He disrespected his dad. But his self-righteousness was different from the younger son. He had self-indulgence. The self-indulgence of sinning against the father and, bring, and getting that inheritance. He even accused, the elder son even accused the father of never preparing a feast for him. It's interesting in that statement, he, he doesn't include the father in the party. The father's not a part of his party. He just wants to party with his friends. The elder son does not even recognize his brother as his brother, for he calls him his father's son, not his brother. Both sons are lost and wayward. The father concludes this parable, or Jesus concludes this parable, with the father responding to the son saying, your brother, not my son, your brother, was lost and now is found. So it is fitting to celebrate being the elder son who would inherit everything that his father owns should be joining in the father's mission and rejoicing over the lost son coming home. You know, this parable is so, it, it can go so many different directions and all of them are right. <laughs> this is crazy. Were the Pharisees and scribes like the elder son? Absolutely. That is why Jesus told these parables. It was directly directed toward them. They hold on to the Hebrew scriptures and practice obedience, but their heart is far from God, even being judgmental and critical in their mind about others who need Jesus. They're unclean. I don't want to be around them not joining in his mission to bring his people home. What about us? Let's let the rubber hit the road here. Who are we in this last parable? The lost son? The elder son? You could experience both in your Christian journey at different times. Starting as one and then possibly becoming the other. For instance, after walking with Jesus for a while, you could become self-righteous, getting puffed up in your knowledge and not being gracious to others. Maybe even becoming critical of others. So, so we become like the Pharisees or the elder brother, not keeping the mission of the Father in your heart, thus becoming bitter and estranged from the Father while being active in the church. All this can happen right here. Be careful. Have you lost the joy of your salvation? You once knew it, but then it's kind of become rote. It is also possible to go the other direction, starting in a legalistic manner, and then seeing God's mercy and His rich grace, and then confessing your sin and a gospel renewal happening in your life. Like the younger son, you become like-minded with the father. In, these, in this parable, these three parables, we don't see what happens to the sons, or this last parable really, but we see how the father reacts. We see what the father is like we see who Jesus, how he is describing his father. In Luke 15, we see three pictures, a shepherd, a woman, and a father, all seeking something that is lost. A shepherd who rejoices over a lost sheep that was found. A woman rejoicing over a lost coin, and a father rejoicing over a lost son. Each giving us a picture, not a full picture, of what, of one of what God is like, of who he is like, Seeking and finding that which is lost, not giving justice, but being most merciful and gracious. Did the father have the right to give justice to his younger son, to his older son? Absolutely. But he didn't. 
God who seeks what is lost, but what he seeks does not stay lost. God finds it in heaven, rejoices and celebrates, for that which is lost is now found. This parable shows the mercy and grace of God the Father in his ordering events to restore his people who are lost to his family. Ephesians 2 reads, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, but God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. There's no works in that statement. Because if there was, we couldn't be saved. We are incapable of saving ourselves. And then in 1 John 3, see what kind of love the Father has given us, that we should be called the children of God, and so we are. As we finish this year and begin 2024, let us be mindful of where we are in relationship to the Father. For true children rejoice and celebrate with the Father in His mission of finding the lost. Remember, Christ came to dwell with His people. That's what we just celebrated. To find and secure those that are lost. We are called to join the Father's mission by reflecting the light of Christ in this dark and dying world. You know, it's interesting that we're doing an equip workshop on evangelism. I would encourage you all to make every point to be there. Are you experiencing the joy of the Father and His great mercy and grace? Do you know the triune God? Do you seem to be struggling with your walk with Jesus? Possibly your love for the Lord has grown cold. Is the Lord calling you today and you know you need Him? Scripture tells us, for without faith it is impossible to please God. And that the wages of our sin is death. An eternal death, experiencing God's judgment and wrath. If you do not know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, then today is the day of your salvation. If you think you are saved but are uncertain, please come see me and let's talk about your salvation so you can be certain. If you have any questions, if these questions or any other questions come to mind, please see one of the elders. Please talk to us because there's nothing more important than your certainty of your salvation. Let us pray. Most gracious Heavenly Father, these three parables just scream of your goodness from carrying us over your shoulders, for seeking for us no matter where we are or what we're in or what we're doing, you find us where we are. But you don't leave us there, you transform us. You bring us out of the difficulties and you reform our life and our mind. Lord, I pray that you would be with us, not only today, but this week until the next Lord's Day, that we might be a light in this dark and dying world, reflecting the light of Jesus. Dear Jesus, thank you for being our prophet, our priest, and our king, for it is you that we worship this day. It's in your name we pray. Amen.